Hello and welcome back to What If Geography, the podcast. Uh, this is the podcast where we dredge up all kinds of what if scenarios and talk about them in terms of, well, I guess geography. Um, and so if you've listened to the first episode, which I hope you have, because this is part two, this is that. now part two. So if you <laughs> haven't, if you're, if you're starting here, uh, first weird place to start, who starts at episode two? I don't know. It could happen. It's <laughs> it the, could maybe happen. it's the one that pops up. Yeah. Well, so this is your, uh, this is your formal notice. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> go back and listen to part one but because, come back but come back right yeah yeah come back <laughs> but you're gonna want to listen to the first part because um what we're gonna talk about now um really might not make a whole lot of sense uh maybe i don't maybe it'll it, there's important context in there's, the first episode yeah it's it's super important we'll context. catch you up though in case you don't want to do there's it. gonna be a little bit of a recap uh but that is not a substitute for um, the first episode. So agreed. If you haven't watched, if you haven't, or not watched, um, if you haven't listened to the first podcast, go back, listen to that. Um, otherwise, welcome back. Um, we're going to continue our conversation um, on just generally uh, uh, what if water runs out in the American or sorry, the Southwest of the United States. I'm going to keep messing that up. Um, uh, but before we do, uh, let's just go ahead and do some introductions again. So I'm going to start. Uh, with just introducing the show. Uh, so this is the What If Geography podcast. Uh, those of you who are listening on YouTube probably are familiar with the What If Geography YouTube channel, which is a YouTube channel that I started earlier this year uh, that really just covers all these wacky, zany, what if scenarios in a geographic context. Um, and really, I want to just re-explain why are we now doing a podcast? And that is well, we can go into so much more detail because you've had a lot of viewers yeah. uh, to your YouTube channel that have been very interested, but they they want more. They, they want to find out. Well, what about this? What about that? Uh, how can we find out more about this? And exactly. so the podcast is designed to be a, a more in depth examination of uh, some of the topics you've already explored and, and other topics that uh, that will just. Uh, start talking about on the podcast that that we haven't covered that you haven't covered on the youtube exactly yeah i mean my youtube channel is great and i honestly i love doing them um what usually ends up happening is i do a literal mountains worth of research on any given topic um and then i have to distill everything down into eight to 12 minutes because that's the way the almighty youtube algorithm works um that's the format that's the format right uh and I have to create all these, you know, really nice graphics that go with them. And it's, you know, honestly, if I if I if I had to do or if I could do videos even longer than that, I don't even know if I could, because pulling together all the graphics and the editing actually is it's labor intensive. It's very labor intensive. And I am one person. That's right. Um, and now uh, so, so all so all that's to say is the podcast made a lot of sense in order to dive deeper into these subjects and also farm out a little bit of the work to my co-host um, who I'm just going to let him introduce himself once again. Great. Well, thank you, Jeff. My name is Hunter. I am a professor of geography at Portland State University. Uh, I teach a wide variety of geography classes uh, and research things that deal with place. Uh, some of my research deals with soccer. Some of it deals with graffiti. Some of it deals <laughs> with music. So maybe we'll delve into some of those topics. They're all related to geography. They, it, it turns out <laughs> that it's true. They are. And I'm also the co-author of a couple books that I've written with David Bannis and, and a team of, of colleagues, the first of which is called Portlandness, a cultural atlas. And the second is called Upper Left Cities, a cultural atlas of San Francisco, Portland, and Seattle. So if you want to get a little bit more flavor of the kinds of things that, that I'm involved with, Jeff as well, because he's a big contributor to the second book, uh, consider checking those out. Yeah, they're really fun books. Um yeah, honestly, if you just want to learn um, a little bit more about the Pacific Northwest, or I guess San Francisco is not technically culturally Pacific Northwest, but within the context, um, they're very th three very related cities. Um, it's a really fun, interesting book, and you can find them basically on any wherever you get your books. It's yeah. also just a really interesting way of looking at places, looking at mm -hmm. cities. So uh, that's another reason we wrote the books is to give people an example of how we can look at places that we know really well in a new light. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, and so, you know, for those of you who are listening, um, my name is Jeff Gibson. Um, I am, I'm not a professor of geography. However, I did get my, uh, uh, bachelor's degree in geography, um, at Portland state university. 
Um, I went on to get my master's degree in urban planning, which uh, again, I contend is just a macro version of geography. It's really just looking at geography of cities. Um, That's right. Yeah. Um, and you've taught also. And I, I've, I've taught a little bit at, at Portland State. And today I currently work uh, within the city planning profession um, doing city planning things. And so you'll, you might notice a lot of my videos sort of have that urbanism tint to it. And that is my own bias. And honestly, I'm I'm okay with that. We both like cities, so <laughs> we, we'll be talking we about love cities. cities yeah. <laughs> um, and so, um, uh, I guess really quick, um, before we get into the rest of the episode, um, let's just t- talk a little bit about why geography. Um, Hunter, you're a professor of geography. Why geography? Well, geography allows us to look at pretty much whatever we want, uh, and it lo- lets us uh, look at some similarities, some differences. Um, and sort of articulate not just how places are different or similar to one another, but the connections between the places. So uh, the flows that go through them, uh, the different economic or social or political or cultural or or environmental aspects of places, geography is really well suited for examining those things. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, at some point as we get deeper into the podcast, we'll probably do less and less of this sort of like elongated introduction. But people, uh, they don't know, you know, geography is this discipline that oof, that is, doesn't, uh, is maybe not as popular or well-known as other disciplines. And geography sometimes is that one, you know, if you grew up in the United States, it's that one day in eighth grade where you learn the state <laughs> capitals. <laughs> but uh, geography is a lot more than that. So we just want to make a plug for, for this discipline that we've both been involved in and learned a lot mm-hmm. from, and we're trying to bring to the masses with our podcast. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, so yes. Yeah, so I love geography. I love, it's a great way to explain and learn about the world. Um, and I guess just to conclude on my own introduction, if you're, if you happen to be listening to this, not through YouTube, uh, you should know that, Hey, there's a YouTube channel. If you want, um, smaller episodes, uh, youtube.com slash what if geography will get you there check so, it out check it out it should be a lot of fun so let's get back into the episode of the day or that's the right week um so, so if you probably listen to um if so it, i guess if you if if you're just now listening again go go back and listen to the first episode if if you're now here with us for the second step second episode um here we go here we go yeah let's uh, we're gonna do a, a quick recap um because it's been about a week break um it hasn't been a week for us we are actually just sitting here just talking it's the exact about same day 20 minutes, <laughs> about 20 yeah. minutes. um but that helps us because it keeps it fresh in our that's right that's <laughs> so, right so um we are talking uh largely about what if water were to run out in the uh, southwest united states um and so broadly we talked uh, quite a bit about um well, uh, we talked a lot about the Colorado River. Where water comes from. So yeah. the Colorado River ends up being a massive source of water, of fresh water for people in uh, the seven states that were, you know, that are part of this agreement that we talked about last the time. The Colorado River Compact. That's right. And um, we also talked about the fact that although many cities are very dependent on this water, it's agriculture that draws most, most of the water is drawn is used for agriculture, you know, some 80%. And so agriculture will figure prominently in our discussions today as well. We talked about uh, that, uh, you know, we're experiencing a drought right now. It's sometimes called a mega drought, which means that it's a drought that's been experienced over several decades. Now, that doesn't mean that some of the years in those decades weren't wet years, but that Ooh, over, that is good that's a really important thing because people might yeah. think, well, you know, I, 2005 was wet. You know, how could yeah. this be a mega drought? And we're looking at, at a slightly slightly larger uh, horizon of time. And so if we average all that out and look at the, you know, the rainfall uh, over that period of time, we can call it a drought or a mega drought. Yeah. Um, the current drought is uh, began in about the year 2000. So it's been over 20 years and is reported to be the worst in about 1,200 years. Mm-hmm. Uh, apparently, they figured this out through tree ring research. It's a little bit beyond our, our topic today. Yeah. But um, anybody who has been paying attention, who lives in this area, certainly acutely aware. <laughs> and, and if you haven't, that these are really big issues that have come up uh, even this year, deal, in trying to understand how to deal with the uh, diminishing amount of water from the Colorado River. Yeah. And just to... Just to backtrack real quick, um, talking about these ideas of wet years um, 
and how they, I guess, man, the, I guess, the, so the, the, the wet years are not manipulating our perception of, of climate change and, and the mega drought. Um, but they definitely help feed a certain narrative um, that we hear from politicians mostly. Um, and it's just a really important point to make that we didn't actually talk at all about in the first episode in that, yeah, there are years that have been and will be into the future uh, historically wet. Um, in fact, actually, actually I think as, I, as we're recording this, um, somebody was just telling me earlier today that uh, Las Vegas had so much rain that um, um, the, uh, or maybe this was yesterday, that the casinos were flooding. I didn't know that. Yeah, wow. um, that that the casinos were flooding, and that there was there's just no there's there was not enough ways to get the water out of the city and into the drain pipes. It was just so much rain, monsoon level rains. Right, droughts mean don't mean that it's not going to keep raining. Yeah, yeah, That's right. It, it's it's and again and and I think this this plays into the whole aspect of climate change. And boy, there's going to be a lot of episodes on climate change because it's just, I mean, it's it's impacting everybody and everywhere and everything. Right. Well, an important point to make as well is that. You know, scientists are telling us, climate scientists, that there would have been a drought without people. Right. Like there's there still would have been a drought. However, the impacts that humans have, have brought have have made it much worse. Right. Right. So it's just it's a, it's just really important to not fall into that trap of, um, oh, well, it's a good year and therefore everything is fixed. And I think this is often a trap that um, people in California and and culturally the Southwest, but you know, let's just say Arizona, and Nevada in particular, pretty uh, regularly fall into is that they'll have a wet year. Um, you know, I think I'm thinking back to California where they were in a historic drought up until let's say 2015. I can't re exact, remember the exact year. Then a lot of rain came through um, and actually their drought, like as, as recorded by the drought monitor um, had sort of rescinded. And so people sort of stopped thinking about it um, as a natural disaster that was impacting them. And now they're back in. Despite the fact the drought was actually still going on. The drought was still going on. And remember, if you don't live in this area that's experiencing the drought, then you are still experiencing this in a way because of the connections that we have through agriculture. A lot of the food that we eat you know, may have been grown in this area. Mm -hmm. You know, we talk about jobs, social relations, all of those tie into these places. So even if you don't live in the southwestern part of the United States, uh, we're connected to what's going on there. Exactly. Yeah. And so just keep going with our recap. Um, uh, we talked a lot about desalination. That's right. Um, and so what like so Hunter, what is desalination? Well, it's the process of removing salt from salt water such that it becomes fresh water and viable for uh, human consumption, agriculture, and the things that we use mm -hmm. fresh water for. And, uh, you know, a lot of people, desalinization plants exist. Uh, and uh, we think I mentioned in the last episode that uh, San Diego County gets 10% of its water from there. So that right. there not has insignificant. Yeah. not insignificant. There has been some success there, but we did talk about a lot of the challenges involved with that. A lot of them deal with environmental aspects of putting briny water, which is heavily salted water, uh, back into the environment or trying to do something out else with it mm -hmm. uh, it can devastate um, in ocean environments and uh, it can also have a big impact on the land if we try to dispose of it on land mm -hmm. there's also enormous amount of cost involved in building these technologies um, and there is uh, the question of transporting water uh, to places that need it that uh, from desalinization plants so it's it's there is some degree of, of prospect and hope that is associated with desalinization, but there are a lot of problems with it, uh, which probably explain why it hasn't been used more extensively uh, in the United States as a solution to some of these drought problems. Exactly. Yeah, it's it's a complicated solution. Now, it, that's not to say it can't be a solution. There's not one solution. It might be part of it, right. but it certainly alone is not going to deliver us to the kind of water consumption that people are used to uh, and that agriculture is used to being able to draw from to grow the kind of crops that are grown today. Exactly. It's not the remedy to all of our, yeah, that's right, um, to, to all of our water woes. So, um, that, so that's basically going to be your recap. So 
that's our Again, recap, huh? Yeah, that, okay. that's our recap. Yeah, uh, unless there's more. That, that no, we, I think we, we go should, from here. Add. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and just to say, um. Again, uh, go back and listen to the first episode if if, if you haven't listened to it because um, that's all you're getting. Oh, there's one more thing. There's one, <laughs> there's, there's one more, there's one more thing, thing, actually, which is that there's a complex negotiations that happen oh, between boy. the yes. different states mm-hmm. um, that make this even more complicated. And you know, we talked in the first episode the history of some of these things, the fact that the states are trying to come up with have historically since 1922 to come up with agreements among them so that they don't have a policy imposed upon them by the federal government of the United States. We also talked about the fact that um, if you are using water first, that you continue to have rights to that water. And historically, that's been the case. And that has oh, a lot boy. to do with yeah. California um, having sort of a, a privileged situation at the table. Mm-hmm. In Arizona, who was the last to sign that particular um, compact, uh, having to experience a lot of the initial cuts. Uh, there is a piece of information I have here we did not share last time, which was where does Arizona get its water from? And this is circa 2019, so this is always mm-hmm. changing. Um, but at that point, groundwater was already 39%. So already been probably increased from previous years because they're not be able to draw as much from the Colorado River. The Colorado River provides 34% of Arizona's water. Other surface water, 19%. We talked about the fact that one of the reasons aquifers aren't uh, uh, replenished as quickly is because Mm -hmm. of surface water being collected from cities in ways which they hadn't been in decades past. And then treated wastewater being 9%. Mm. So that just gives you a little bit of a slice um, from one place in in this part of uh, the United States uh, where water is coming from. Yeah. And we're going to, I think we're going to talk a little bit more about um, actual solutions a little bit. At the end of this, I mean, we're we're, we're not Pro- water proposed scientists. solutions. That's um, right. This is the what if part. Yeah, um, we're gonna get into some fun what if scenarios. Um, we will get into a little bit of some some realistic solutions, um, but just to give you a hint at what that might be, um, boy, conservation is going to be a big one, and that's one that's it. As you just read through that list, that's like the lowest one right now. So. Right. Well, I mean, <laughs> conservation is the challenge that's set between these states that they can't draw as much water and they start to reach the limits of Colorado river water and surface water. And they start drawing from groundwater and that becomes less and less viable. Uh, You know, how much does it take for conservation to be um, adopted into policy for Mm -hmm. these states? And of course that's what they're wrestling with right now. So there's certainly, you know, what can an individual do that's not insignificant, Mm -hmm. But compared to the kinds of policies that might need to be adopted, um, the other thing that I don't think we touched, we touched a little bit upon the the amount of water used by agriculture, but the fact that because the, a lot of the rights lie with agriculture now, some of the proposed solutions include urban areas buying some of the rights for that water Ooh. from uh, from, agriculture. from agriculture. And of course, that doesn't increase more water. It makes things disproportionate. But we start talking about, well, what might have to change mm-hmm. because of the decrease in water available? Yeah. Yeah. It gets it gets really wild. Um, and so I guess with that, um, so you've been listening to a, a couple of episodes now on the whole concept of what if water runs out in this region of the United States? Um, and so now we are finally going to get to some of that content. Uh, but first let's talk about some ads. (laughs) Okay. We'll get back (laughs) to it. We'll get back to you in just a second. So, uh, and with that products and we're back. Um, so when we left you, we had just recapped, we actually gave you um, quite a bit more information because we just, again, we have so much research, uh, talking about, uh, water in this region of the United States. Um, but now we're going to get into sort of the meat and really this, the whole topic of, of the podcast, which is the what if, right? So, I mean, a good way to maybe start doing that would be to look at a place that's already starting to experience this kind of situation. Yes. So, uh, I hope listener, uh, you've heard about Cape Town, South Africa, um, which is a 
I mean, it's it's not the largest city in in South Africa, right? Johannesburg is. Um, I think that's the case. Yeah, um, but Cape Town is certainly a large city uh, within uh, South Africa. It's on the very well. It's on the Cape um, of uh, really the continent. Um, so close to water. So close to water, right? Um, they they do have an ocean there. Uh, so if we go back to the middle of the um, the twenty teens, um, I believe probably around twenty fifteen. Uh, Cape Town suffered really a catastrophic uh, drought um, where they they ran out of water. I mean, they didn't really run out of water, but they came really close um, to the point where there were some pretty drastic measures. I mean, the government had to start rationing water. So the supplies were so low that they couldn't just let the taps flow wherever they were. They had to cut back and start... Uh, having blackouts of water, essentially. Yeah, um, and I, I can't remember the exact statistic um, off the top of my head, but um, geez, I want to say that at the worst of it, people could only take a really a shower um, every other day, um, which is not, boy, it's not a, it's well, not they, a good scenario. Well, they had to choose, you know, <laughs> yeah. they had to choose how to use your water, yeah. and so they had what, like, 50, like they, I think each person had like forty gallons or something like that. Yeah, when that's that goes pretty quickly when you have to consume water, mm -hmm. you have to cook with water, you have to clean what you cook with water, mm -hmm. you have to use water in order to flush human waste away, um, you have to bathe with water, um, you have to feed animals water, mm -hmm. uh, and that goes pretty quickly. Right. Yeah, and I think it just goes to. I, Really, I think it goes to show that we as humans, and certainly we as Americans, don't realize how much water we use. Um, probably many of us do not. Probably, yeah, probably yeah. not aware. Exactly right. Like, and I, this is actually fine. This is a tangent, but I remember um, at one point there was a little device um, that you could buy that you would just like throw in your shower, um, and it would start changing color um, as you were using more water. And basically, I think it would hit like red when it was like, okay, you, like now is when you should. And I, this is when I was still living in California. Um, so this is mid 2000s, um, the OOs. Um, and so really, it would, it would just tell you when you're like, okay, like you're now using more water than uh, you should be. Um, and boy, did that turn red fast. <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. You didn't, you like, you would not realize just how fast, like, it would turn red until it was like, oh, I've only been in here for two minutes. Um, and the reality is that we just don't have the infrastructure in place to um, naturally keep water flow lower, you know, such as things that go inside your faucets that make it. Not well, and it will take a pretty sure. huge change in mm -hmm. human behavior, not impossible and not unprecedented. I mean, you can, you know, get yourself wet and mm -hmm. then you can turn the water off and then you can lather off, yeah. leather up and you can rinse it off. And I mean, this is the way that it works in many mm -hmm. places. This is the way that people in the United States at times have had to operate. Mm -hmm. But I'm suspecting that for many people, that's not really on their minds. Right. And so Cape Town serves as a really good example just because, uh, one, it, it actually happened or at least it came very close to happening. Um, and it, the actual reality is that... Um, Basically, when they were almost at their day zero and they had a, a day zero, imagine an, an advent calendar for no more water. Um, that's sort of what they were doing. Um, zero water, I think they referred to it. Zero as. water. Um, you know, it came pretty close and then and then it rained um, and then things actually started to improve for a little while. And actually, and I actually don't know what, what the current situation is like. I wouldn't be surprised if they are back in some sort of um, situation, just knowing that's the state of droughts around the world. And we use this as an example because mm -hmm. it's a city that has a degree of economic development that's somewhat on par with the United mm -hmm. States. I mean, it, you know, we should say that there are many, many people in the world who don't have enough water, mm -hmm. who have don't have access to clean water. Right. And so, you know, this is this conversation is a pretty privileged conversation to be having because mm -hmm. we're able to talk about having long showers and all this kind of stuff and what happens if we run out of water. Um, and we're talking about the United States, and this is a very big issue, but we you know want to make sure that we acknowledge that there are people in the world who have, this is a daily Absolutely. situation. Yeah. This is a yeah. daily existence. And... You know, we, we're not making light of that. And uh, we want to make sure that, you know, we, we mentioned that this is this is already reality and has been a reality for, for millions and millions of people throughout mm -hmm. the world. 
Right. Yeah, exactly. So Cape Town provides that like it's just a really good example. It's a of bit a, of an analog of yeah, sorts of a of a uh, for lack of a better term, a westernized city. Yeah. What happens mm-hmm. when you're used to having lots of water exactly. and all of a sudden it's you're, not there it's anymore. Not there. Yeah. yeah. And you just can't you can't use it or you you have great restrictions. So um, if we think back to Cape Town 2015, we can start drawing conclusions for Phoenix uh, in particular, I would say. And Los Angeles. And Los Angeles. And Las Vegas. And Las Vegas. Tucson. Um, but these Tucson. are but, but yeah, when you're talking about you know Phoenix and and Los Angeles, we're talking about uh, cities with very large populations. Yeah, but. In particular, I want to, so I, I do, I want to call it Phoenix. Okay. Um, yeah. In particular, because um, an, uh, there's a, con- and we talked about this a little bit in the first episode, but we didn't actually name it. Um, Phoenix has a confluence of events going against it right now. Okay. Um, one that um, they are heavily dependent on the Colorado River. Arizona is not, is last in line, last and right. That's right. Um, and they are negative in their groundwater reserves. Okay. So Tucson is still not negative. Uh, Los Angeles is in California, which is not having to do undertake so anything. So Phoenix is the city that's going to experience this yeah. most acutely first. Mm-hmm. And Las Vegas actually only gets a, a, or Nevada as a whole only gets a small percentage of its actual water from the Colorado River. So I think we're going to see Phoenix get hit hardest and first um, for all of those reasons. So, um, so let's talk a little bit about why. Well, actually. Um, before we even get to Phoenix as a potential city, I think there's a good parallel with Cape Town, but um, let's go back even a little bit further and let's talk about the Hoover Dam. Okay. Because this is, so so Cape Town happened um, and is now doing a little bit better. I'm not sure what their current drought situation is like, but it gave us a really good example of sort of that end scenario that we'll talk about with, with respects to Phoenix. Um, but there's another very serious situation brewing uh, on the Colorado River, and that is the Hoover Dam. So energy uh, generation is what we're talking energy gen- about. Yeah. yeah, so energy generation. So the Hoover Dam generates a lot of energy. It's one of the largest mm-hmm. uh, generators of electricity uh, uh, among dams in the United States. The Glen Canyon Dam also is responsible for generating electricity. Mm-hmm. But it's getting, it's and it's really getting to the point where it's not, so there's a specific level of water. So Lake Mead is the lake that is, was created basically by the Hoover Dam, right? You build a lake and or you build a dam and that creates a lake. Um, for Glen Canyon, it's Lake Powell. Yeah, for, for Glen Canyon, it's Lake Powell. Um, Lake Mead has gotten now down to a point where it's getting pretty close. And I don't know the exact footage as of today. I recall it was about 12 feet away, um, 10 to 12 feet away as a few months ago, from getting to the point where it no longer is capable of generating power. And um, that's a lot of power um, that that is created. As we know, uh, hydroelectricity um certainly on the Western half of the United States generates a lot of our electricity for those of us up here in Portland, uh, me and Hunter, um, that's a large part of our, of our electricity. Hoover dam is also a large part of the electricity down in, uh, the Southwest, including for, uh, uh, the metropolitan district of Southern California, it gets about 30% state of Nevada, about 23% Arizona, about 19% Los Angeles itself, over 15%. If the Hoover Dam is no longer able to generate this electricity, where do they have to figure out other means, right? Where does that come from? That's right. And if it comes back from if it comes from cutting back from brownouts or blackouts, you know, these are That's are, very recent these, like news too. <laughs> right. These are areas that are in the desert that mm-hmm. depend on air conditioning. Uh so because people normally a lot of people would have trouble surviving in a desert without air conditioning, right. and you know it's the it's the uh, oftentimes it's the very young and the very old that are particularly vulnerable to you know environments that are uh, you know hot, and so these are some of the populations that are going to be uh, particularly at risk mm-hmm. if power generation uh, is is cut back. Right. Yeah, and we don't often like think about that. Um, I guess we. I think rec- very recently we've been thinking about that. So um, I think as the time of this this video is being published, it's now a few weeks old. At the time of recording, um, it was really only last week or two that um, California had to do staged um, either rolling blackouts or um, just basically 
asking people to not use as much power or if you have a smart thermostat like physically you know playing with people's power usage you know with respects to their thermostats because there was such a high demand on the draw of energy right and we like to think of energy as this kind of unlimited resource um i think i certainly have done that in the past i think most people who are not really thinking about electricity don't really think that is a finite amount or until it until it goes away until for a while, away. and you're thinking, well, what about all the food in my refrigerator? Exactly. You know, all of these issues start to come up, um, and and you realize how easy it might be to yeah. take it for granted. Yeah, and like the reality is, like just like you said, like if we look at Phoenix, because again, I think Phoenix is a prime example of things to start happening sooner rather than a lot of the other cities. Um, again, Phoenix uh, gets a lot hotter. Um, I, well, actually, don't know that. With respect to Las Vegas, I don't know which one gets hotter. I would still, I would still bet that Phoenix gets hotter, um, but both of them get very hot. Right, we're we're talking about a threshold that would be dangerous yeah. for some people to you know be living in, right, uh, without some kind of uh, you know air conditioning, artificial support, yeah. air conditioning. Yeah, it's very hot. It's like a hundred and twenty degrees is not uncommon mm, i feel that feels high to me feels but high. i mean it might not take temperatures of that degree yeah, I'm gonna look it up and, right now. all right you can look it up i'm not sure it necessarily takes temperatures of that degrees to uh to to become impactful for people's health um you know certainly we have to protect you know hospitals right if i mean if we're doing rolling blackouts it's we have to be able to to protect certain areas and so uh, the pressures will become uh, disproportionate. There's a geography to to where power outages happen, and that will become something people might become more and more familiar with uh, a, as this might become a reality. I remember when we had the that extreme heat in Portland a while back, and it hit 117. I mean, I don't think that that's a very common temperature for a lot of cities, and a lot of cities have experienced that. Um, so, so I do, I actually, oh. I have, I have some what do you fun have? stats here. So, okay. um, so, it's, so it, you're, you were right. It's not super common that it hits over 120 degrees, though it has, um, it's okay. hit 122, 121, 120 multiple times. Um, and this is in Phoenix. This is in Phoenix. Okay. Phoenix. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, or maybe, maybe, um, maybe more specifically Maricopa uh, County, which is the county that okay. Phoenix lives in. However, this is a this is a fun fact, um, or not not so fun fact. Phoenix uh, has hit a record amount of uh, days of over 110 degrees for the country at 18, 18 days straight. When was this? Was this? This was actually a little while ago. This was okay. back in the 1970s. Okay. Um, but I think it goes to show that um, 110 it degree. Over a, a stretch of that long, that's almost a month. That's uh, <laughs> that's getting close to a month. That's three weeks. Yeah. <laughs> when we did, when we did, uh, that changes things for it people. It changes things, yeah. right? That's, I mean, that's deadly, right? Um, and I don't think we're too far from a situation where that potentially gets beaten, um, based on just general climate. Yeah. Change. So when we're talking about what happens if there's no water or mm -hmm. if the threshold of water goes down. You know, we'll be getting into the the water part of it, but mm -hmm. the energy generation part of this is also significant mm -hmm. and, and something we need to consider. Yeah, and I think for what it's worth, I don't actually know um, if Phoenix gets a lot of their energy from the Hoover Dam directly. I do know a lot of parts of northern Arizona do. However, there's going to be reverberating effects, just as there always are. Um, if the Hoover Dam isn't able to generate enough electricity for certain communities, you're going to have to get that elect electricity from other places, and that's going to mean a net negative for everybody. So. It's just a, it's a really big consideration um, that I don't think we really talk enough about in terms of the lack of water. The Hoover Dam is quite big and it's it's quite impactful in the region. And so with that, let's talk a little bit more about water itself. Um, and what if what if water I, let, let's just name it. What if there's no more water in the in the, the southwest? And right. Well, when we, I mean, this is an important thing. It. it it doesn't take there being no water for things to go 
sideways for things to go very wrong. So if there was no water, and we can talk about that situation, mm -hmm. but we can also talk about what happens if there's so little water that there has to be rationing and mm -hmm. so little water that the kinds of things that happen in agriculture and in everybody's jobs and in everybody's social life has to change significantly. Mm -hmm. And so if there's a huge decrease in water, I mean, first of all, I'm thinking it becomes a less attractive place for people to go to. I and mean, there's a, there's a lot of people migrating to this part of the country, mm -hmm. um, particularly from colder climates. Mm -hmm. Right. And sometimes people who are in retirement, uh, you know, the East coast, that was always Florida that people, you know, you'd heard people retiring to, but then, um, which has it, its own water issues, has its own water <laughs> issues, but Arizona has also become a major destination. Mm -hmm. Um, Utah has become a destination. California is a mm -hmm. destination. And so all of a sudden we see a change in people wanting to go to these places. And that changes the economy. That changes uh, construction. That changes people's jobs. So even when we start to get big decreases in water, we start to see um, things start to become severe for people. There's not as much uh, business. There's not as much opportunities for people. Um, and so that's, I mean, that's almost the first thing we could talk about. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so, okay. So let's talk a little bit about, um, and actually let's, let's frame this in agriculture. Okay. I think there's a, there's a drawdown. The region starts to lose water and that's going to impact agriculture because it first and foremost, I mean, we talked a little bit about how it impacting Phoenix more so than other cities, but I think before it impacts the cities, it's going to naturally impact agriculture quite a bit. And even if agriculture gets the first take at some of this water, mm -hmm. most of the populations live in cities. And right. when the cities are starting to get less water and they start to look at agriculture, they're going to start to find a way to demand some of that water. And we're going to see some pressure on agriculture. So one of the things that we can think about, what if, is, well, what kind of crops are going to have to change? We talked about the water-intensive crops of cotton, of alfalfa, uh, almonds mm -hmm. that are grown in this part of the country. And one of the potential things that might have to shift or the pressures might lead to shift is changing the kind of agriculture that goes on, mm -hmm. uh, which includes the production of meat that we talked about as well. So even before we run out of water, we might see shifts in agriculture. Right. So like basically there's just going to be, so if we really look at it, there's probably going to be less, um, well, there's going to be less almonds. Um, there's probably gonna be less, I mean, actually I know that Arizona grows a lot of our citrus. Mm -hmm. Um, citrus is also very water intensive. So all of a sudden we're starting to think about these things becoming more expensive at the stores, um, and generally people having less access to them, unless there's now a shift in where these things are grown. Right. right. So, um, let's. Of course, you can't just start growing citrus tomorrow. And then yeah, and that's exactly. the thing is that a lot of these take some Which, and almonds that, you know, these some of these foods um, take an investment in time in order for the industries to get going as well. Right. Um, Which we're kind of feeling at least in some way uh, through Ukraine right now. Right. The the war in Ukraine, um, Ukraine his, or not historically, but I guess recent historic uh, history has grown a lot of wheat. For the world ukraine is an extremely uh viable place for agriculture exactly. it has great soils and it is one of the one of the wheat producers mm -hmm. of the world for and, sure and so that faucet got turned off rather suddenly with russia invading uh illegally i should say um ukraine and the world couldn't just spin up a bunch of wheat crops and so that has now hit a lot of places um some more than others uh uh quite a bit. Right. And it changes the ability of people to afford certain foods as well. So that if you have a decrease in one area that starts to change the prices all over the place. And so certain staple crops become less available and it's the poor who are disproportionately affected by mm -hmm. the increase in prices. They have less disposable income, less money in their food budgets. And so we start to see, we probably start to see with this situation and changes in agriculture is not only changes towards different kinds of things grown, but the populations that we've most affected by. Them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And really it would, I mean, at a certain point it would necessitate. And again, we say this a lot, but probably a future episode, um, there's a lot of corn grown in places that has, have historically been associated in the U S with the breadbasket of the world, right? Iowa, Nebraska, 
Indiana, maybe. I actually don't know where the the, the Midwest, line is drawn, but right? the, the yeah. generally the Midwest. Um, that would then need to reassume some of this. Well, it would be interesting to see, and that's the what if mm-hmm. part. That's if, a what if some yeah. of the area that's because we generate more corn than we actually need in this country. Yeah, and like and, a lot of it's turned into that's, ethanol, that's, right? Uh, some of it's turned yeah. into ethanol, mm-hmm. but um, we have subsidies for corn in this in in this country um, that encourage people to grow corn, that encourage mm-hmm. farmers to grow corn. So you have to wonder if there would be enough political will on a national level or on the state on state levels to start to change the that situation mm-hmm. to change these subsidies so that people farmers are and corporations are encouraged to grow other staple crops or if we just double down on corn and all of a sudden <laughs> you know the kinds of things that corn feeds into i do love corn chips to, <laughs> right right they start to be you know corn is found in lots of different things mm-hmm. and if all of a sudden yeah, I mean, these impacts are going to be felt not just in agriculture in this area, but how do the other regions of the country and maybe other regions of North America, of the world, start to respond to a dip in production in agriculture in mm-hmm. the southwest of the United States? Yes, and I think that's probably a good segue to talking about our next probably biggest what-if scenario, um, which is migration. Well, but- before we do that, I know it's about time for ads. <laughs> okay, right. That's it's called a cliffhanger, I think. It's the cliffhanger. So um, we're going to play you some lovely ads by some lovely companies that I don't know who's going to be playing ads. So um, we'll see you guys in a couple minutes. And we're back. Um, and we left you with a little bit of a cliffhanger in talking about uh, migration um, because that's a big aspect of a lack of water. <laughs> if there's no water, people are going to have to start living someplace else. Right. Maybe. There. Yeah. I think that's really the crux of sort of everything we're talking about, right? We are a water-based species. We need water to live. Um, and without it, humans simply cannot live um, in that location anymore. I, I think a stopgap is to try and get water to people. But at a certain point, people just have to move away. And I think naturally people would at a certain point just keep Keep moving away. I mean, this, the cities that we're talking about, these large cities that we've mentioned a number of times, are places that haven't supported large populations until the 20th century, right? Right. It's been very tribal um, uh, historically, right? Uh, the Navajo, uh, the Hopi um, have lived in the, the general region for millennia. And well, we should be talking about the huge impact it's going to have on Native American people to have this kind of scenario where the the lands that they've occupied for millennia um, suddenly become even more difficult for them to subsist on. Mm-hmm. And so there is a disproportionate uh, impact on, on Native Americans, on indigenous people who suddenly uh, not only are going to continue with sort of economic struggles that they might have, um, but they're going to be faced with the situation of maybe having to uh, move away from areas that are intrinsic mm-hmm. to uh, their economies, their social life, their cultural life, their spiritual life. Uh, and that's that's a, a very, very uh, a big situation to have to face. Yeah, I mean, they're basically, I mean, and we can get to this a little bit more in depth, but um, the Native Americans of the region, historically not treated well at all. Well, and then also not, I mean, it, it, really important to the conversation right now, not being included in mm-hmm. the conversations with how water resources should be used. Exactly. And so that's one of the reasons they're being disproportionately affected is because their perspectives, their um, need to to represent their groups has not been part of the policies that have been adopted through these state compacts um, that we've mentioned, you know, over the last couple episodes, which just is just so classic America, <laughs> for lack of a better like way to put it. It's we're just, talking about power dynamics yeah, here right now, and without the the power to um, to be a part of decision making at this level. Mm-hmm. Um, then those perspectives aren't taken to account. And, Absolutely, yeah. And that's that's one of the huge impacts that mm-hmm. we can expect is that 
um, you know, Native American populations are going to be uh, at, at a very uh, acute situation mm -hmm. if, if the water uh, situation becomes more severe than it already is. Yeah. And so if we talk about it becoming more severe and we get to the point where there is basically no no water to sustain the current populations are there. Um, well, I'm just going to launch into a question. Um, Hunter, what regions do you think would be most impacted aside from the obvious one, which would be the the Southwest, but what, what regions would be most impacted? Well, I mean, you have to think, I mean, there's what areas are going to be able to sustain larger populations that people are going to want to go to what areas are, might have the infrastructure to handle that mm -hmm. what areas are going to have job opportunities and well as well and then what areas have social do people have social connections to people don't just move anywhere mm -hmm. they need to have some kind of social base oftentimes for them to feel that they can move someplace um, so it's it's hard to take all that into account but I, i'm thinking one of the regions that would maybe uh, have some uh, receive some of the migration would be the region that we're living in, which is the Pacific Northwest. Pacific Northwest, right? Because people, there's not that there couldn't be water shortages and issues here, uh, but there's at least a perception that there's a lot of water mm -hmm. here, and that there is space. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, people don't want to hear that, but there is. People there's actually quite a bit of space that, here. Right? <laughs> people think that it's becoming very crowded, but if you look at the density of the Pacific Northwest, other Again, areas. Again, another episode, density. <laughs> right. This is an area that might receive some of that, uh, that that potential migration that would come from from this situation. Yeah. And like, I think you hit on a point, like, we don't know. So Portland is sort of sits right on the Columbia, the confluence of Columbia and the Willamette Rivers. Uh, Columbia being one of the great rivers of uh, North America, as we established in the first episode. Um, the Willamette, also a very large river. Um, for us uh, here in Portland, there seems to be an infinite amount of water. Um, however, Portland and and really all of the other cities along the Columbia River are Portland being the largest one, um, relatively small. Right, Portland is two and a half, two point six million people. The in entire metro area. The area. Um, and so that if that if that and it, I think if we were to add up the population of every single like city and town along the I think we would still be far under even the size of um, Los Angeles. I think I actually I don't even know if we would hit the size of Phoenix, which is about four and a half million. Right. I think that's true. Um, and so if all of a sudden there was that amount of people that might actually impact some things. But the perception is and I think the reality is that we do just naturally have a lot more water. Right. So. Portland is fed by the Bull Run watershed, um, which comes from a very specific area uh, in the Cascade Mountain Range that is not snowmelt uh, fed. It is actually entirely 100% precipitation fed. Um, and so it, it's a very interesting uh, uh, method of how we get our water here. So the, in other words, the what if might lead to pressures, economic pressures, but also water pressures mm -hmm. in some of the areas that people I mean, yeah. might arrive to. Um, Northern California mm -hmm. it sort of also would be maybe a natural destination for people in the area mm -hmm. because, again, the idea is that it's wetter, um, that there might be opportunities there, there's some infrastructure there. Right. Uh, what are you thinking? Well, well, I, I, just to go back to the Pacific Northwest, I think it makes sense that people would move here. And actually, I would, I mean, if people... We moved here. I, we moved here. Um, and I think if people aren't thinking about that, I, geez, I hope somebody at the state of Oregon and the state of Washington, um, and honestly... Uh, the province of British Columbia are thinking about this because um, I think it's going to happen, um, at least to some degree. Um, I think what will be interesting is just to see how it impacts the water resources of this area. Um, obviously, we can look at the Colorado River um, and just see, OK, a river is not infinite. Um, and I think that's that's a big um, uh, theme is that water might feel infinite until it no longer feels infinite. <laughs> of course, people who have experienced this acute water loss might be very discerning as to where their next destination exactly. is going to be. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that might be a critical criterion for them to decide where that destination is. And there is, I think, more so than even the Pacific Northwest, there is one area that probably comes closest to... <laughs> 
feeling like it has the an infinite amount of water and that is the great lakes okay right? yeah. um and there's a really fun statistic that i i pulled out in one of my episodes um where if you were to drain the, all of the great lakes um over the continental united states and you were just to take it out of those lakes and put it over the united states um everywhere in the country would be nine feet underwater so just look around you you're now nine feet underwater interesting that's how much water there is so it's it that's a lot of water because you know continental united states is really quite large right um so all that's to say is that the great lakes has i think it has some around 20 to 21 percent of all of the surface fresh water on the planet um by and large the most amount of fresh water that is readily accessible um within the western hemisphere um so i think it makes for a natural uh place for people to move to and there are more bigger cities than there are in the pacific Northwest. and there's more yeah exactly there are more large cities in, in that not area. the city or people are going to necessarily move to cities but mm -hmm. many people will because that's where people have economic opportunity housing opportunity uh, so it makes sense that urban and suburban areas are going to be major destinations right and i think the there's like a really interesting so as we looked over like the last like 40 to 60 years um we've seen phoenix grow and grow and generally the southwest grow and grow in population um las vegas and um and california certainly as well um and largely they've been a net uh they've been gaining their their population from um those same cities that sort of are around the great lakes as well as the nor northeast um but i would say even more particularly we're talking cleveland detroit uh, uh maybe indianapolis chicago milwaukee um a lot of those a lot of people have moved from those areas to the southwest um and so this could almost be really kind of like a reverse migration right um i want to say 40 million over the last four decades have moved from no i think there might be 40 million inside the region in general um if we're if we're not talking about all of california we're just talking about southern california but phoenix and las vegas um but let's like probably about 35 million people have sort of migrated over over to the region over the last uh, few decades. Um, and so we could see that amount of people move back, which in some cases, okay, well, maybe there, there there's now an ample amount of room. We've seen, you know, uh, par large parts of these cities, especially Detroit, um, sort of get hollowed out um, for a variety of reasons. And this could be a way to reinvigorate it. What I don't think th that we've really accounted for is that 35 million people moved over to the southwest over a few decades we could see as many or more move back in a span of in a much shorter period five years ten years like a very short amount of time relative to the migration that happened down to the southwest you know, one is, i mean if we take a look at uh, take a historical look right now what you're saying makes me think of um the way that the western united states was developed economically in the first place mm -hmm. And a lot of it uh, had to do with feeding the population on the East Coast of the United States. Mm -hmm. And so you had um, a lot of corn that was grown and then brought into Chicago that was processed and then brought to the Eastern United States. You saw the elimination of um, the bison, which was the right. mm -hmm. you know, a very important uh, food source uh, for Native Americans and the sort of decimation of Native American populations. You saw the driving of longhorn cattle from Texas up into the Western United States so that that meat could then be brought to Chicago, slaughtered in, the sh in Chicago, and then mm -hmm. brought to the East Coast. Mm -hmm. So the transformation of the Western United States and that migration, which has been much more recent than what I'm talking about, it's very interesting to see, as you're suggesting, some kind of reversal. Well, all of a sudden, this this area that was, you know, carved out economically for the East Coast po part of the population, that population that has ended up there may be going back towards Chicago and surrounding cities, mm -hmm. and then maybe to the East Coast as well. The East Coast, the North. East has actually lost an enormous amount of population compared mm -hmm. to other parts of the country as there's been migration to the South, as there's been migration to the Southwest. And it would be interesting to see if the Northeast and the East Coast, you know, in the sort of wetter areas, because you know, <laughs> we've got some water pressures in Atlanta and other places, uh, might be a place where some people end up as well. Yeah.
And I, I think that's a very real possibility. I think so you hit on something um, even before we were talking about the Pacific Northwest that I think people are 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 going to move back to places where they still have connections. That's right. Um, and I think people still have a lot of connections to more so than the Pacific Northwest. Even I think obviously a lot of people are going to have connections to the Pacific Northwest. Um, but they're going to have a lot of connections with family and friends um, from the Great Lakes and Northeast regions. Because, mm -hmm. again, over the last four decades, a lot of people have moved from those two regions specifically and are inherently still going to have family who still live up there. And, and I mean, the, the other aspect of this, and we've touched on it a little bit, is jobs. You know, so people are going to lose jobs because of the shortage of water and agriculture mm -hmm. and transportation, trucking and such in entertainment fields um, and where are people who uh, depend on those livelihoods going to be able to find work and mm -hmm. how will there be a transition of economies in other places that will be able to absorb people with those kinds of skills and mm -hmm. those kinds of experiences um, that's pretty tough to predict but you know, if we were able to track some of that we might be able to find some answers as, as to what might happen as well yeah and so there are yeah well, so, so, okay, so there's two more regions I really want to talk about um, that I think are very interesting regions um, within this context. I think the Pacific Northwest and the Great Lakes and Northeast um, regions make a lot of sense for the obvious that there is a seeming abundance of water um, or an actual abundance of water. Um, the first I want to talk about is the, sort of the Mississippi River sort of corridor. Okay. Um, Mississippi River is far and away the largest river um, in in the Western Hemisphere, or not in the Western Hemisphere, it's the Amazon River is actually the largest. Right. But Mississippi is certainly in North America and um, is is really quite a an enormous river compared to the Columbia and um, uh, the Colorado. Right, if we're talking about the importance of agriculture, exactly. we're talking about this river. Um, however, I don't know, uh, so there was a recent uh, article that came out um, some scientists published a, a, uh, an article in some journal um, that predicted that basically that entire corridor from New Orleans all the way up to Chicago um, is basically going to become the American heat belt, um, which is an area that is described as having prolonged days of extreme heat of over 120 degrees you know, by the mid-century. Increasing water demand. Increasing water demands, increasing demand. livability and in energy. Um, and so I think while we like to think of the Mississippi River as being this abundance of water, which it is, um, it's not to take away from that at all. However, there are other um, aspects of that region that will make it very difficult for people to move to. And I, again, I think that there is going to be a portion of this population that's going to be shell-shocked in a way where they're going to naturally go to areas that um, will feel safe. And I don't know if the Mississippi River will meet that criteria. You know, it's interesting. We're talking about the Mississippi River doing some research on these topics. I stumbled across a letter to the editor in a small newspaper in <laughs> somewhere in the Southwest and the Southwestern United States. And um, the the writer of this letter to the editor said, "Hey, you know they've got a lot of water over there. Oh the boy, we're talking about River. a pipeline. <laughs> you know why not build a pipeline directly to Lake Powell and start to replenishing Lake Powell that way?" And to which somebody else in Minnesota, I think it was, wrote a letter to that same newspaper saying, "Yeah, I don't think that we're going to do that," and you know, sort of <laughs> threatening what could happen. And what this speaks to is the kind of desperation that people might sort of feel and yeah. the increased oh antagonism that a situation like this would arise. And I, for most of my lifetime, I've either read or been told that the next wars aren't going to be fought over oil. They're going to be fought or territory. They're going to be fought over water. Mm -hmm. And so thinking about the internal divisions that could arise based on the dis, you know the, the the lack of water in one part of the country and that's another thing that might arise from this situation is some is some very um acute conflicts involving different states different groups of people in different states based on the perception of what should happen to address this very issue yeah so again 
just to reiterate, there will be a future episode on a water pipeline um, because it's it's a it's a deep topic. Um, in fact, uh, I have an episode on YouTube um, about what if we built a water pipeline from the Great Lakes to the Southwest. Check it out. Check it out. Um, again, it's only going to touch on the subject for about eight to 12 minutes. There's obviously a lot. There's a lot there. <laughs> there's a lot of infrastructure um, and cost and political ooh, will boy. that would have to be marshaled in order ooh, to make boy. this happen. Oh, boy. <laughs> but it's something that can be discussed. It's Yes, it's it's an interesting, it's a fascinating topic. Um, and we will get to it someday. Um, but for all the points that uh, Hunter just brought up, yeah, it, it's it's incredibly challenging. I um, mean, it's not it's not a good solution. Um, the other region that I did want to talk about um, hmm. is Alaska. Okay, I thought that might come up. Yeah, Alaska um, is interesting for a lot of reasons. Um, one, it's a huge it's a huge area of land that's very much not populated at all. Um, it does have quite a bit of water. Um, however, it has lost population over the last decade and is expected to continue losing population. And there, for people who don't know, there's only, I think there's only about 600,000 people who live up there. Um, well, there's, I mean, one of the reasons is that there's when people, the main reason that people migrate or immigrate mm -hmm. Is because of ec the perceived economic opportunity. Exactly, and there's not really, and there's not a ton of economic opportunity there. Yeah. So that would have to materialize for people to want to choose that mm -hmm. spot as a destination to relocate to. Exactly. So I think so. Alaska is often brought up in this sort of topic of well, a lot of people move up to Alaska, you know, especially as the the planet gets warmer. And yeah, that that could be a scenario. Um, I think there's probably a likelihood that Alaska will gain population due to climate refugees. I just don't know how much. I think there's more obvious um, locations that um, are simply easier um, that we've already named: the Pacific Northwest, Northeast, and Great Lakes. I mean, the regions. cost of of buying oh my God. food, yeah. So for I, example, that's why I used to alone. live in Alaska, and it's okay, yeah, yeah. It's expensive, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And so that's you know that would take a lot for that to change. And so that's, that's a consideration as well. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, there's, you know, the what ifs are, are, are pretty severe and bleak in <laughs> yeah. some ways here, but you know, when you're talking about millions and tens of millions of people potentially living in an area where they don't have a dependable source of water, things as you're suggesting might have to change pretty dramatically in a short period of time. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I guess that's why we chose this first episode. There's a lot to talk about. <laughs> There's a about. lot to talk about. Um, I feel like we're 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 kind of winding down here. Um, I think we're over an hour at this point. Um, so I guess um, I don't know. Is there anything else left to? Left to I mean, we there. There's a lot of there's a lot more episodes coming around this general topic. I think there, there's more that could be said, but I think we've covered a lot to sort of yeah. uh, give people a, a, a lot of different yeah. ideas about what some of the challenges are now, what some of the history is, and what the potential challenges could be. Right. And so I guess with that, um, Hunter, you got any pluggables to plug? I would just remind people that if they want to learn more about geography in an interesting way, we've got these books that we've created, uh, Portlandness, a cultural atlas, Upper Left Cities, a cultural atlas of San Francisco, Portland, and Seattle. And the point is, is that this is an interesting way to look at places wherever you live. And so as a guide for thinking about things unconventionally with some very beautiful and interesting maps, uh, I'll put that out there for your consideration. Yeah. And you can find me on uh, Twitter at Geographic Geoff. It's Geographic, G-E-O-F-F, -F, all one word. Uh, or Instagram, uh, it's at uh, geographic underscore geoff, G-E-O-F-F. -F. Um, and then you can also find, um, if you just want to follow this podcast and the show on Twitter, you can just follow it at uh, what if geography, all one word. Uh, so easy peasy. Tune in next week. We're going to talk um, about, uh, well, borders. Um, and the, the, the potential lack thereof. Yeah, really. Yeah, I guess. Well, I mean, we can just say in a high level what if what if there was no borders what if there were no what if there were no international borders <laughs> um and it's it's actually something that's not been on youtube yet um 
on your ch on your channel. Yeah, it's so it's, it's it's something I've actually thought quite a bit about. Um, I haven't been able to figure out how to turn it into an eight well, maybe, to 12 minute episode. Maybe so. we can uh, mine what we have to Ex talk about exactly. next week and then s and figure that one out. Exactly. So I'm really excited to talk about it and I think it's gonna be really fun. So please join us. Join us. Uh, thanks for listening. Uh, tune in next week. See you next time. Or